Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for standing by, and welcome to the Pure Storage third quarter fiscal year 2021 earnings conf release conference call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. At the conclusion of our prepared remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If anyone should require assistance during the conference, please press the star zero on your touch tone pad at any time. As a reminder, this call is being recorded. I would now like to introduce your host for today's conference call, Ms. Nicole Nizia. Nizia, please go ahead. Thank you and good afternoon. Welcome to the Pure Storage third quarter fiscal 2021 earnings call. My name is Nicole Nutius, Investor Relations at Pure Storage. Joining me today are our CEO, Charlie Giancarlo, our CFO, Kevin Chrysler, and our VP of Strategy, Matt Kixmuller. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that during this call, management will make forward-looking statements, which are all subject to various risks and uncertainties. These include statements regarding the COVID-19 pandemic and related disruptions, our growth and sales prospects, including our Q4 outlook, competitive industry and technology trends, our strategy and its advantages, our current and future product offerings, including Portworks, and business and operations. Any forward-looking statements that we make are based on facts and assumptions as of today and we undertake no obligation to update them. Our actual results may differ materially from the results forecasted, and reported results should not be considered as an indication of future performance. A discussion of some of the risks and uncertainties related to the business is contained in our filings with the SEC, and we refer you to these public filings. During this call, we will discuss non-GAAP measures and talking about the company's performance, and reconciliations to the most directly comparable gap measures are provided in our earnings press release and slides. This call is being broadcast live on the Pure Storage Investor Relations website and is being recorded for playback purposes. An archive of the webcast will be available on the IR website and is the property of Pure Storage. With that, I'll turn the call over to our CEO, Charlie Giancarlo. Good afternoon and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on today's earnings call. As we look to the end of 2020 with relief and look forward with high hopes for a brighter 2021, my thoughts are with all of you on this call. I hope that you, your families, colleagues, and friends are all staying healthy and faring well. The challenges and the changes we've experienced this year have been extraordinary and seem never ending, and they have certainly reset all of our expectations and assumptions. COVID has been the change agent of this decade. And we have all learned many lessons in stamina and resilience. Like you, I am excited about the many reports on the fantastic progress with vaccines and therapies created by the world's scientists, doctors, and engineers. However, we all know that there will continue to be challenges due to the virus and its economic impact for months to come for all of our communities and stakeholders. Through all of the challenges that COVID created this past year, Pure has been there for our customers, delivering capacity, performance, and services that enabled our customers to cope and thrive during the crisis. I feel confident that regardless of the rate of progress in the battle against COVID, Pure and most of our customers have turned the corner on their plans and ability to operate in this new normal. I am pleased with this quarter's performance and the progress Pure has made. Growth in our global enterprise business continues to provide me with confidence that we will exit this downturn with an accelerated opportunity. Our strategy and our vision to deliver the modern data experience strongly resonates with our customers. In our first 10 years, Pure completely changed customers' expectations of what they should see from storage arrays and storage vendors. In our second decade, we are changing the expectations for hybrid cloud data and storage management. We are growing from a two-product company 
to offering a full multi-cloud data services platform, increasing our relevance to both those who build infrastructure, that is IT, and those that build applications, namely developers and DevOps. I am very pleased to welcome the PortWorks team, now part of the Pure family. PortWorks brings to Pure a Kubernetes data services platform for cloud-native applications running across container-based hybrid cloud environments. With PortWorks and our existing Pure Service Orchestrator, or PSO, we have expanded our industry-leading data services capabilities to both traditional and cloud-native applications and containers. We've made good progress with the integration, and the PortWorks team continues to perform well, easily beating their pre-acquisition sales plan. Our strategy with PortWorks is to continue their software-defined storage, container, and Kubernetes control roadmap, and layer in Pure's capabilities with VMs and bare metal workloads, all managed through our unique SaaS-based Pure One management system. Customers are looking for more complete solutions to their digital transformation. They are not specifically looking to migrate to subscriptions. They are not specifically moving to SaaS and hyperscalers because it's the cloud. Customers are moving to services and suppliers that provide the outcomes they desire rather than just the means for customers to create those outcomes themselves. Pure solutions continue to evolve to enable customers to automate their data storage and management and to deliver data management as code to their developers. And importantly, like our Purity software, PortWorks is just as comfortably deployed in cloud as on-premises, supporting a new set of customers who are born in the cloud and may never consider on-prem infrastructure. This quarter, we saw strong momentum in both existing and new PortWorks customers, including Eurobank, Expedient, and Datascan. And I'm pleased to share that we were just named a leader by GigaOM for Kubernetes data protection. Leading customers are choosing containers, PortWorks, and PSO to build and run their most strategic new initiatives. They are also choosing to use object storage for these same advanced systems. And we are benefiting from this demand in the continued strong momentum for FlashBlade. FlashBlade continues to be chosen by customers to consolidate and modernize their unstructured data across a number of uses, including technical computing, analytics, and rapid recovery. Momentum with customers like First National Bankers Bank, the Louisiana Office of Technology Services, and Sinai Health System demonstrates that FlashBlade continues to be the leading choice to enable rapid recovery to defeat ransomware. We are also seeing strong interest and initial customer adoption for our recently released Flash Recover solution to modernize the entire data protection stack. This quarter, Cadence, a global leader in electronic design and computational software, selected Pure's Fast File and Object Service through our Pure as a Service offering to accelerate their transition to a modern IT environment and to automate their data services. FlashBlade's performance and ability to consolidate many workloads, combined with our consumption-based model and service-level guarantees, enables Cadence to increase developer productivity and accelerate their time to market. Customers like Cadence are looking to deliver outcomes to their developers. Pure's subscription services, which include our Evergreen and Pure as a Service offerings, had strong growth again this quarter. Selecting Pure as a Service in Q3, organizations such as ME Bank in Australia and the University of Texas Health Science Center recognize the flexibility and choice that these offerings provide. Our unified subscription in Pure as a Service, which includes Cloud Block Store, enables customers to subscribe to storage both in their data center and in the cloud, paying for only what they consume, making migration to the public cloud possible at any time without worrying about stranded assets. The operational benefits of subscribing to a service managed by Pure makes their lives substantially easier. 
Today marks another milestone, an industry first for our Pure as a Service offering with the announcement of the Pure Service Catalog. The new service catalog provides cloud-like transparency by publishing pricing for on-premises and hybrid cloud storage delivered as a service. So customers can easily choose the right storage service level for each workload. Combined with Pure One's AI-driven workload planner, customers can place workloads on the right storage service tier based on intelligence derived from thousands of customer scenarios. FlasherAy C, well into its second generation, continues to grow at an accelerated pace. This month, FlasherAy C received the Best of Show Award at the Flash Memory Summit for most innovative flash memory technology. The performance and financial efficiencies delivered by FlasherAy C enable customers to both consolidate workloads and reduce costs below that of hybrid disk arrays. The full flash array portfolio enables customers to address a wide range of price performance levels for both block and file workloads, all delivered by our single purity code base. The services available under our unified subscription on-prem and in the cloud are powered by the same purity software, providing customers flexibility and consistency in how and where they want to place their applications and consume their data services. As we scale our company from a single product just four years ago to a broad-based provider of data storage capabilities, we continue to scale our management team as well. Earlier this month, we announced Dominic Delfino as our new Chief Revenue Officer reporting directly to me. Dominic brings fresh perspective and incredible expertise selling subscription and consumption-based business models with software innovation at their core. He has a deep understanding for our customers' digital transformation strategies and is well-versed in introducing new solutions into the market, working closely with customers to deliver solutions that improve their business outcomes. I am excited to welcome him as we position Pure for its next stage of growth. Navigating the ebb and flow of this COVID crisis has certainly been an exercise in flexibility and resilience for all organizations and actually all individuals worldwide. As we have stated in prior earnings calls, after a rush to solve for new, urgent, and immediate needs in Q1, companies reset in Q2 to replan their digital strategies given the new environment. This past Q3, we saw customers begin to re-engage with clearer plans to drive digital transformation. As part of these new initiatives, customers have largely done away with business as usual and are looking to simplify their operations yet provide their developers with efficient and self-service infrastructure. Pure's offerings provide the efficiency, reliability, and automation these customers are craving. And with environmental impact concerns rising in importance, Pure makes it easy for organizations to improve their sustainability initiatives with the savings in power, cooling, and electronic waste we deliver across our portfolio. Pure has made fantastic progress over the last several years to position us well for the future. We have dramatically expanded our product portfolio we have enabled our capabilities to be run and consumed as a service. We've created a true hybrid cloud environment for enterprise workloads. And now we deliver storage solutions for cloud native application development and deployment. Even with the uncertainties which remain in the economy from the pandemic, we are confident in our vision, our strategy, and the ability of our team to grow and scale. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Charlie, and good afternoon. We are pleased with our Q3 financial performance and execution as we continue to navigate headwinds caused by COVID-19. Our Q3 results demonstrate the value our product and subscription solutions provide to our customers. Strong sales and recurring revenue growth continues for both our evergreen and unified pure-as-a-service subscription offerings. Q3 total revenue was $410.6 million, down 4.2% year over year, slightly exceeding our expectations at the beginning of the quarter. 
Product revenue was $274.5 million, down 15.1% year over year. And subscription services revenue totaled $136.1 million, growing 29.5% year over year. Subscription services revenue during Q3 represents approximately 33% of total revenue, up from approximately 25% of total revenue during Q3 of the prior year. Subscription services revenue includes Evergreen subscriptions and our unified Pure as a Service subscription, which includes Cloud Block Store. We were pleased with the strong sales growth and demand for our subscription services, Flash Blade, and Flash Array C offerings during the quarter. Our investments in innovation continue to drive results as both our Flash Blade platform and our second generation Flash Array C offerings achieve their highest level of sales during the quarter. Customers, including large enterprise customers, continue to invest in our Flash Blade platform for their high performance file and object needs, including data protection. Our remaining performance obligations, or RPO, which includes our committed and non cancelable future revenue, grew approximately 25% year over year, slightly exceeding $1 billion at the end of the quarter. Total deferred revenue, which is included in RPO, was $763 million, growing 19% year over year. Bookings or sales during Q3, excluding cancelable orders, was generally flat, declining less than 1% year over year. Total revenue in the United States during Q3 was $302.1 million, declining 4% year over year. And total international revenue was $108.5 million, declining approximately 3% year over year. Across our full solution portfolio, we continue to acquire new customers despite the challenging environment created by COVID-19. We acquired over 316 new customers this quarter, compared to 379 customers during Q3 of the prior year. Non-GAAP gross margins for product and subscription services during the quarter was 69.1%, compared to 71.7% during the same quarter in the prior year. Non-GAAP product gross margin declined approximately three points year over year and one half of a point sequentially. Non-GAAP product gross margins in the prior year benefited from both cost reductions caused by the unprecedented price reductions of NAND as well as mix shift where we sold larger flash array systems. Non-GAAP subscription services gross margin increased approximately one half of a point year over year and declined one point sequentially. Non-GAAP operating profit during the quarter was approximately 3.4 million compared to 29.1 million during Q3 of the prior year. Operating expenses during the quarter have remained relatively flat year over year as we continue to invest in innovation and scale. Non-GAAP net income during Q3 was 1.8 million and non-GAAP net income per share was one penny. Non-GAAP net income in Q3 of the prior year was $34.2 million, and non-GAAP net income per share was $0.13. Cents. Weighted average shares used for the non-GAAP net earnings per share calculation was 284.8 million shares in Q3 and 272.2 million shares in the prior year. We are pleased to have completed the close of our acquisition of Portworx during the quarter. Our purchase of Portworx was funded through a combination of our revolving line of credit and cash. Total cash and investments at the end of Q3 is approximately $1.2 billion. During Q3, we returned $21.4 million to shareholders through share repurchases of 1.36 million shares. Approximately $23.6 million of our share repurchase authorization remains. Total headcount at the end of the quarter was approximately 3,860 employees. Now moving to our Q4 outlook, we remain confident in our strategy and execution as we navigate the impacts caused by COVID-19. Visibility of business conditions has improved, but uncertainty of the near-term impacts the global resurgence of COVID may have on our business 
continues to exist. While we navigate the impacts of COVID, we will continue to share internal expectations of our business performance, but not provide formal guidance. We are pleased to see strong, sequential, broad-based growth of our total product pipeline opportunity. However, we have not achieved the same levels as Q4 of the prior year. Our current internal view is that total revenues for the full fiscal year will be $1.66 billion, representing approximately 1% of growth. And total revenues for Q4 will be approximately $480 million, a decline of 2% year over year. We expect operating expenses during Q4 to increase slightly year over year, including a full quarter of investment for Portworks. With our current view of revenue, we believe operating profit for the full year will be approximately $35 million and approximately $26 million in Q4. Overall, we are pleased with our Q3 financial performance and execution and resilience of our employees, partners, and customers. The performance, simplicity, and flexibility of our solutions are creating valuable outcomes for our customers, which is further accentuated during the COVID-19 environment. Our rich portfolio of solutions, including the addition of Portworks, positions us for strong revenue growth, including growth of our recurring revenues. With that, we will now open the call for questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a question, please press star 1 on your touch-tone telephone. In the interest of time, we ask that you please limit yourself to one question and one follow-up question. Once your questions have been answered, please jump back in the question and answer queue. We'll pause just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. And your first question comes from the line of Jason Lear of William Blair. Yes. Hi. Um, I, I wanted to know from you guys if you had any sense of pent-up demand going into 2021, and, and then any update on NAN pricing and how that's how that might be impacting the street pricing. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Good to hear your voice. Uh, you know, we're very pleased with what we saw in terms of pickup in momentum uh, in Q3. Uh, the the improvement in visibility and the in the, uh, the the uh, the fact that our our customers' plans seem to solidify uh, during the quarter. You know, all the way through the end of the quarter is a, a very good reason for optimi for optimism as as we go forward. Um, I don't know that I'd call it pent up demand as much as I would call it. You know, the new uh, they're planning for, um, you know, uh, their plans for digital transformation, if anything, are uh, accelerated. Uh, and that's, you know, good news for uh, the collection and storage of, of data as well as uh, managing managing that data and, and being able to, to, uh, uh, to take more out of it to improve their business. And I think that is going to be – that is going to continue even after uh, the uh, – COVID uh, is uh, is long uh, forgotten, and so and uh, with all of the optimism around vaccines, I think we believe that come spring or early summer, you know, we'll start to see uh, you know new buy-in patterns and and uh, new acceleration emerge. Um, I, you know, whether that's pent-up demand or whether that's based on accelerated digital transformation trends, I, I'll I'll leave that up to you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Alex Kurtz of KeyBank Capital Markets. Yeah, thanks. Can you guys hear me okay? Absolutely, Alex. Great. I uh, hope everyone's uh, safe and healthy, and we'll have a, a good Thanksgiving week here. So, Indeed. So, Charlie, uh, you brought in a new head of sales, obviously, from a very strong background in, in software and subscription. And it, it's clear that, you know, with peers of service doing well, um, there's a there's a move towards a bigger focus on this type of you know selling motion and licensing to your customers. So I guess if you could just frame up how you would talk to your sales organization and to custom, big customers next fiscal year, like what's the message from Pure about how you want to be selling a product, how you wanted to how how you want it to be licensed, and and ultimately for Kevin, like what does this mean for for revenue growth, because obviously deferred would would start to pick up. So, some, some big 
top level question. Uh, you know, just do the best you can on those. You bet. And well, actually, I'm fully practiced because I addressed my entire sales force on this uh, just a couple of weeks ago at our uh, Global Leadership Summit. So the the, you know, we, uh, the world is changing, and the world is changing from uh, it's. If you ask why are they going to SaaS, why are they going to the cloud? It's not because it's in the cloud. Uh, you know, it's because they're choosing to uh, they're choosing services and vendors that provide them with outcomes. Uh, uh, better outcomes rather than just the means for a customer to, de to develop the outcome for themselves. Uh, you know, SaaS, if you will, if you go to a SaaS service, um, it actually provides a direct interface to their internal customers uh, with, a, with a solution rather than just providing, for example, software for the customer to implement themselves. And so as we go forward, uh, we uh, are uh, increasingly tailoring our solutions to provide uh, those outcomes for customers. What our customers want is data management, uh, not a device that for them to be able to create data management out of. Uh, and you see that in our Pure as a Service offering that we announced today, which is our Pure Services catalog where a customer now can go online, uh, uh, find all sorts of tools to measure uh, and figure out what type of service categories and tiers they need for their workloads, and then completely subscribe to it online. And whether it's on-prem on or in the cloud, uh, Pure takes the responsibility for delivering that to the customer, you know, as a set of service level guarantees. Uh, so increasingly, you know, our approach is to provide customers what they need, both on-prem and in the cloud but to do so through a service offering. Now, that ge does generally mean migrating to uh, more of a uh, subscription style of sales, although the customers can get this even if they go with a uh, CapEx uh, purchase. But uh, you, we've been signaling for quite a while that we're, that our expectations that subscriptions would be picking up uh, at, you know, as a percentage of our sales. That has largely come out to be true, as, as you can tell from our announcements this quarter about the improvement in overall uh, subscription uh, sales. Uh, and we expect that to continue to be true, but, you know, we will manage that. Uh, we're uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, forecasting that we're providing to the street takes that into account, and so we feel comfortable with, uh, with that. And, of course, we think this is a better solution for our customers, and so uh, increasingly our sales team uh, wants to go where the customers are going, and, and uh, they feel good about the uh, changes we're making. And I'll, I'll just add uh, a little bit to that, Charlie. Um, look, you know, a third of our revenue is really coming from subscription services to begin with. So we, we've got a great start uh, to this transition. And given that our evergreen subscription model is running at scale, the idea that uh, we're going to have ramp of our peers of service uh, unified subscription will have less of an impact, uh, in my mind, on, on total revenue, though there will be uh, some impact. Uh, the other benefit that we'll see is, is obviously Portworks uh, being part of our subscription revenue, and that'll be incremental uh, to our growth curve uh, as it relates to our subscription services. Thank you. The next question comes from Aaron Rakers of Wells Fargo. Yeah, thanks uh, for taking the question. Um, I, I want to kind of build on that last comment around subscription. I, I think one of the metrics that, that's always a little bit interesting is just the, the, the RPO balance expansion and, and that delta relative to deferred revenue. You know, I think it was up about 47.5% year over year. Um, can, can you just remind us how much of that is of the, the true subscription uh, business? And, and was there any port works uh, contribution in that number this, this quarter? Uh, great question, and this is Kevin. How you doing, Aaron? Uh, you know, in terms of the, the differential, when you look at it sequentially and the growth we're seeing sequentially between deferred revenue and RPO, that is uh, really our, our peers of service offering uh, that's contributing to that build. Uh, and then Portworks uh, would not have a, a significant uh, contribution, though there would be some contribution to RPO for, for Portworks. As okay. well. And it's just, as a, it's just as a quick follow-up, maybe a, a, you know, you've got one of your competitors also reporting tonight. And you're just curious, you know, Power Store's been in the market uh, for a, a quarter or better now. Just kind of update us on what you're seeing in the competitive landscape. Is this, as you say, the digital transformation is, is poised to kind of accelerate? Yeah, I'm going to underwhelm you here, uh, Aaron. We're just not seeing Power Store. I mean, we're the little we're seeing of it is not being terribly successful. So, if anything, uh, when when it's introduced to a customer, it gives us an opportunity to go in 
because it's always a disruptive upgrade uh, to uh, to the customer, regardless of which of the products uh, that they're attempting to sell uh, or upgrade against. So it's just not been a it's not been a big factor. Our win rates generally uh, uh, with Dell have been very consistent. Uh, you know, they're they're consistent quarter by quarter. I'd say no, not not terribly different this quarter. If anything, a little bit better. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, but PowerStore has been largely absent. I will say that most of the time, even if they go in with PowerStore, they quickly change their uh, bid to a, a Power Max, uh, and that's the more typical uh, competition for us. The next question comes from the one of Ben Jalambora of J.P. Morgan. Oh, thank you. Um, hey, Charlie and Kevin. Um, no the first question, um, uh, just on the pipeline, I think you said um, the pipeline is up but is not as uh, as much as last year. But help us understand the comp composition of the pipeline that you're seeing last quarter. I think you kind of indicated that the, the maturity curve is towards the early stage. Has that changed um, at all as we head into Q4? Yeah, great, great question, and uh, absolutely, you know, when we're looking at the uh, pipeline composition, uh, you are right uh, in terms of the year-over-year -year compare. Uh, what we are pleased with is the strength we're seeing sequentially uh, in our build from, from Q3 to Q4, which gives us some confidence in terms of our internal view uh, of our Q4 outlook. And then when we actually uh, peel that back a little bit, we are uh, confident to see some evolution in terms of the aging of those pipeline opportunities. As you mentioned, when we were going into uh, Q3, we saw that uh, you know, we were getting some nice build, but those were earlier stage opportunities. And, and as we're looking at Q4, we see a, a much better balance uh, between uh, early stage opportunities as well as advanced stage. Uh, so nice evolution in terms of what we're seeing uh, sequentially between our, our Q3 and Q4 uh, pipeline. Understood. Thank you for that. Uh, and Charlie, one for you. Um, talking to some of your partners, we have kind of gathered um, that, you, that there has been a, a few mid-eight-figure and even larger PaaS contracts. Help us understand what's driving that. Is that transitory uh, as companies try to preserve cash outlay right now in this environment, or do you think it's it's kind of a fundamental change in hardware buying behavior? Well, I think it's the beginning of a fundamental change in uh, well. Uh, and again, I won't say it's hardware buying behavior. There, uh, we're delivering this as a service. Uh, so I really want to call attention to the fact that. You know, and, and especially with PaaS 2.0, but actually also when we first introduced PaaS, it was a lot more than just a financial construct for customers to acquire hardware. We're delivering it as a service. They have no commitment to long-term holding uh, of the hardware, and it, it's a unified subscription with the same set of services, in fact, the same software in the cloud. Uh, and increasingly, uh, every aspect of their use, usage, if you will, of the service will be service-oriented. Uh, that is to say that, uh, you know, it'll be fully managed, uh, it'll scale up and scale down without, uh, without disruption and without uh, the customer getting involved in that at all. We take full responsibility for it. So I just want to identify that it's not about acquiring hardware. It really is about subscribing to a service that just happens to be on their premise as well as in the cloud. And I do think that over time, yeah, we'll see more and more of this, absolutely. Yeah, just to jump in for a second, I think Charlie's really hitting on one of the key differentiators of PaaS from our competition, where we're really pursuing this like a product opportunity. You know, if you look at our competitors, their uh, offerings tend to come from their financial services groups, and they're just kind of dressed up leases in a different name. You know, we have a business unit that has engineers, has a GM who's running this program, and we're thinking about how we really change the entire customer experience around an as-a-service experience. And so hopefully what you've seen with the launch of the service catalog today is a good example where we're really rethinking what's that entire way a customer thinks about purchasing a service, uh, looks at their existing workloads, and uses AI-driven modeling tools to understand the right service, and then just enjoys the same level of transparency that people have today in the public cloud around open service pricing, performance SLAs, and then driving the process for getting procurement going. So really it's, it's the beginning of a whole new interaction with customers at Pure. And your next question comes from the one from Nahal Truxy of 
North Bend Capital. Uh, yeah, thanks, and uh, congrats on the strong results and uh, strong, strong guidance as well, in my opinion. Um, I, I want to go back to the discussion of RPO, especially the unbilled RPO portion, um, which uh, it was up 16 million QRQ, which is more than the 5 million in a year ago period. So clearly on a year-over-year basis, as Aaron had alluded to, a nice acceleration. But it's still a step down from the 20-plus million in the past two quarters. Um, so does, is that a deceleration of the performance of the past two quarters, or is there some seasonality that you're seeing with the uh, pure as a service, the, the unified pure as a service offerings? You know, um, Nahal, really, I, I think this may be more of a, you know, the fact that we did a, a large uh, pure as a service uh, deal this quarter and we're able to bill for the entire uh, amount up front. So that entire portion is actually in deferred revenue. So uh, when we look at our pure as a service um, trends quarter over quarter, actually they're, they're very strong and we're quite pleased with those trends. Uh, what you're looking at between the unbilled portion versus deferred revenue, we do have some mix in there where we've got some uh, PaaS uh, deals that are being reflected in deferred revenue because we were fortunate to uh, bill for those up front. I see. Okay, great. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thanks, Nahal. Your next question comes from Carl Ackerman of Cowan. Yes, good afternoon. Um, Charlie, starting with you first, if I may, your internal outlook is healthy considering the headwinds across commercial. Um, are, are you seeing any rebound internationally, particularly in Europe, that is giving you greater confidence for the January quarter? Uh, or, or are you actually seeing a sustained improvement in on-prem uh, in the U.S.? And I have a follow-up. Thanks. Yep. It, so so interesting, Carl. So I think uh, international really shows the effect of COVID on, on business in general. So uh, as you know, uh, uh, in Q2, we saw uh, a real improvement um, in an international overall as they came out of the crisis uh, earlier than did uh, the U.S. And we saw an uptick. In Q3, uh, in contrast, we saw um, your, uh, Europe in particular uh, but Asia, but international in general, start to go back into lockdown, you know, early, late September, early October, and already we started to, uh, right, right around the same time with a little, late, little bit of latency, we saw the effect on our business. So COVID really does have an effect on the local economies, whichever country it happens to hit, and it's why we're a little bit cautious for Q4. But we do believe at the same time that businesses now have become, uh, let's say, more accustomed to operating in the COVID environment, and therefore they're, they're more robust in terms of uh, pursuing their, uh, their IT and digital transformation plans. So we don't expect the kind of turn down that we saw in Q2. We, you know, uh, even with our, our cautious optimism, uh, we feel that, uh, you know, we feel confident in, in uh, what, uh, how we're looking at Q4 right now. But uh, you know, clearly, I think once you know the, the same um, the same effect that we saw in Europe when they came out of uh, the uh, crisis in the spring gives us confidence for uh, this spring, especially let's say around the spring to summer of this year. And then with vaccines, we think that'll be a longer term phenomenon. So we're very much looking forward to the future, but we do believe the next few months, uh, you know, are reasons to be a bit a bit more cautious. Yep. Understood. I appreciate that. Uh, for Kevin, um, you know, it, it's quite apparent that your recent acquisition and expansion of as a service offerings today underscore your desire to, you know, increasingly shift your portfolio toward a recurring revenue model. Uh, you know, how does that impact OPEX growth in 2021 uh, or the next couple of quarters? Uh, you know, uh, w when we think about that, will 2021 be characterized by an investment year in sales and marketing? Uh, you know, I guess we've we've modified our um, you know s sales approach, but you know how do we think about the uh, the ability to uh, you know get leverage on the opex side because it's it's certainly uh, I think an, uh, a a great initiative, but um, if we could think about that from an opex side, that would be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Carl. You know, when I think about uh, our operating uh, margin leverage uh, potential, even with the transition to increasing uh, peers of service and our subscription offerings, uh, both are very achievable. Uh, and, and we're planning on that as we, as we look out to, to next year. 
I think we're making some great efforts uh, across the board uh, to leverage uh, our investments, especially this year, uh, as we kind of invested uh, in ahead of the growth curve, if you will, uh, going into next year. Uh, so I, I'm looking to uh, to actually improve uh, operating uh, margin and profitability, uh, even when considering uh, growth in our subscription offerings. Your next question from Mihai Hassini of SIG. Yes, uh, thanks for taking my question. I want to uh, have two follow-ups. I want to go to your presentation slides, specifically uh, slide number five and six. Obviously, the number of new uh, customer addition has declined on a year-over-year -year basis. But what is interesting, the revenue mix is shifting. And I just want to get some clarification. Is that just driven by the change in the, in the customer type, more driven by app developers? And is that what's driving a, a, a more um, uh, a, a better uh, projects especially impacting the subscription services? Is that the right way of thinking about it on a year-over-year -year basis? Well, I'll take that first, Charlie, and then, and then feel free to, to add on. I mean, when we think about our new customers, our, our new customers uh, will either uh, purchase uh, our peer-as-a-service offering, uh, which would contribute to our subscription services, or they'll purchase uh, our integrated uh, appliance uh, that comes with our Evergreen subscription. And so that will play into it uh, as well. But we're also getting a significant amount of momentum uh, with customers who are continuing to invest in their Evergreen subscriptions uh, from a renewal standpoint. And that, uh, that momentum is really coming from our existing customers. Uh, and so that hopefully would answer that question uh, specific to the mix uh, yeah. occurring. Uh, well, let me also answer, uh, the, you know, in terms of the mix of new customers overall, and as you point out, a decline in year over year. I, first of all, I have to say that given the COVID environment, we're pretty pleased with the uh, number of new customers we've been able to gain because, you know, in the COVID environment, clearly incumbents tend to have a bit of an advantage uh, as as new customers are just more – or as customers are more cautious – about considering uh, changes to their existing environment. Uh, that being said, if you were to break down the, the new customers or the net new logos, what you'd find out is, is a, a, a good growth uh, as a percentage in enterprise and, of course, lower net new logos in commercial. And simply, again, because commercial is under pressure worldwide, uh, bec uh, much more so than enterprises, uh, you know, in terms of numbers, uh, from the uh, corona uh, environment. So, again, our expectation is that uh, when the uh, corona uh, epi uh, pandemic abates, uh, hopefully by spring, uh, you know, we're, that we should see a good pickup in this. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. But the, the momentum when we think about our recurring revenues will be driven probably more from our existing customer base as well. Much more from the uh, existing customer base, yeah. Gotcha. And one quick follow-up, more of a house uh, keeping house going item. When I <clears throat> looking at the product revenue, um, as we look into next fiscal year and increase availability of the QLC NAND, is that going to have a positive impact on product margin, or would you prefer passing that along to customer to increase market share? Yeah, uh, let me t uh, take a try at that. I think it's a little bit early for us to be able to uh, opine, uh, you know, with with great confidence on that, but. I, I suppose my belief is that we're u utilizing QLC uh, first and primarily to penetrate into new markets, you know, in the disk space, and therefore disk economics uh, are the ones that we're competing with in that environment. And as such, I would expect margins to be consistent with our overall company margins, rather than uh, to uh, be used as strictly as an as an enhancement. I think over the long term it may improve product, uh, overall product margin, but in the short term, I expect that it's uh, we'll we'll be utilizing it to penetrate into that market. And I'd also say that your your, your question somewhat implied that our QLC product was being um, limited by availability of NAND, and that's not the case. Um, you know, we're in a second generation of that product being GA now. We've now shipped uh, the largest QLC flash module in the industry, our 48 terabyte module. And so we're in a really great place uh, from a supply point of view to uh, to supply that product, and we believe it's really differentiated in the market. Our next question comes from Simon Leopold of Raymond James. 
Thanks for taking the question. First thing, I, I wanted to ask a little bit more about this uh, announcement you've made today about publishing uh, the, the service catalog. I guess I'm trying to think about the potential consequences. One scenario might suggest this could trigger price wars, responses from your competitors. On the other hand, I could imagine maybe this leads to less discounting uh, by you, given that you're putting prices out in print for your, your customers. Just wondering how you think about the various scenarios or outcomes from this uh, action you've taken. I'll, I'll take a first step of that. Um, look, yeah, I guess the first thing here is we're doing this because it's something customers demand, and increasingly customers want to self-qualify, research solutions on their own, uh, do so and understand relative pricing, and uh, you know then contact a sales rep or a channel partner when they're you know much further along in the buy-in process. And so this is, from a pure point of view, is all about really upping our our digital go-to-market uh, chops and being able to sell how customers want to buy much more in this cloud model. Um, in the case of, uh, of, of the service catalog, what we publish in there are MSRP prices. And so, you know, a customer can get uh, a, a discount, obviously, by coming to Pure and working through our channel programs, and that's not published, so there's still some, you know, room for negotiation in there. But, you know, what the service catalog does do is it allows them to very openly see what the different services are, see what the performance levels are, so they can make a good choice around, okay, is it um, worth, you know, a, a 2x increase in spend, you know, to get, a, you know, a, a certain amount of increase in performance. And indeed, if you look at the new service tiers that we've introduced, we now offer a 10x range in pricing uh, for a 20x range in performance. And so there's quite a range of services, and customers have the, the right service level for every workload in their environment. That's, that's very helpful. And just maybe as a follow-up, I, I think earlier in the, the uh, Q&A, you talked about customers adjusting to this new normal. So even as we aren't fully back and don't have a vaccine widely available yet, your customers are adjusting to how they do business. With that in mind, do you think that your uh, next quarter, basically as we turn into next year, you might defy normal seasonality, that we might have a more muted sequential decline as uh, your customers are sort of catching up uh, to business that they didn't do during the pandemic's worst period? Thank you. Yeah, well, it's an interesting question. You know, let, uh, look, we're not, uh, you know, we're not epidemiologists here, uh, uh, but I think it, it's fair to say that our expectation would be that the, that uh, uh, you know, COVID uh, will be with us uh, through the early spring and then hopefully start to abate uh, at that point in time. Uh, and I would expect to see, you know, then, uh, you know, a return to growth economically across the world. That's what we're uh, planning on right around that time, and then get back to, you know, so that might in, uh, suggest greater seasonality next year, uh, simply because the beginning of the year might be a little bit more muted than than the end of the year. But it, for, but from that point going forward, I would expect to start to get back to the, you know our normal seasonality. You know what I what I was pleased to see uh, is a couple things. I was pleased to see overperformance uh, in Q3. Uh, followed by uh, what we're seeing uh, currently is sequential strength uh, going from Q3 to Q4. Um, and, and I think those are positive attributes. I think the COVID resurgence, uh, back to your point, Simon, in terms of, you know, folks uh, knowing how to sell uh, in this new, new environment, customers being more com comfortable purchasing, I think will help mitigate uh, this resurgence we're seeing uh, globally. Uh, and then we just need to see how Q4 performance uh, evolves uh, throughout the quarter. But look, we're, we're really confident in, in our growth drivers, uh, that especially with what we saw in Q3 in terms of our subscription services, uh, Flash Blade uh, performance, and Flash Array C. So it, it's coming together for us. Uh, COVID certainly uh, creates uncertainty. Uh, and, and to Charlie's point, we do expect that to continue in Q1. Uh, but we're going in the right direction. And your next question comes from Tim Long of Barclays. Thank you. Um, yeah, just to, to if I could as well, um, just wanted to follow up on on Flash Array C. Um, just curious what you can what you've kind of learned from Gen One uh, to Gen Two of that product. Um, maybe just you know win rates, deal sizes, new applications. What what are you seeing uh, as that that product 
uh, evolves. And then second, Charlie, if you could just give us, it sounded like enterprise was pretty strong. Could you just give us a little color around uh, small, medium uh, businesses and, and what you think uh, it's going to take uh, to see a better rebound uh, from that customer group? Thank you. Yeah. Well, let me uh, let me give it a shot. You know, in terms of um, the, uh, let me start with the second one first, uh, which is that uh, commercial, as we I think uh, as other companies have identified as well, the mid market and uh, small medium have as a as a group uh, been harder hit by the uh, COVID uh, crisis than uh, than than large enterprise, and perhaps because they were not quite as ready to operate entirely online. Uh, as were many of the large enterprises that had already invested in it. But, so I think it's just a generally stronger economy uh, overall will, will help that. Uh, as you can see, there, it's, not, it's not completely disappeared. The net new logos indicates uh, by us, you know, indicates that uh, there's still, there is still a healthy commercial market, but it's, it's far muted from, uh, you know, from pre-COVID uh, days uh, overall. Uh, I'm sorry, remind me of the first part of the question? Flasher AC. Oh, Flasher AC. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I'll pass it to Kicks in a second, but I think the main thing is that with Flasher AC, with its primary target being the secondary tier market and uh, disk economics, the additional um, pricing flexibility that it gave us to go after the disk market when we were able to introduce true QLC has made a big, had made a big difference and allowed the uh, very fast early momentum allowed that to continue. Yeah, and I guess the only thing I would add is that it just hasn't been the type of product that's been very hard to sell in terms of going and finding um, very focused use cases. Um, it turns out customers run uh, disk-based arrays for a wide range of use cases, and so really the, the easiest way to go to market with it is just to go to a customer who's already bought in and understood the benefits of Flash at the high end of their application space and ask them where they still run a disk array and uh, you know work with them to say, look, if we can actually – you know, sell you an all flash array that brings the simplicity and performance of flash and is actually 30% less expensive than a disk array. Why do we need disk still? Your next question comes from Eric Martinuzzi of Lake Street. Yeah, I wanted to pick apart the pipeline a little bit by vertical. I would assume the, the strength that you've seen, at least sequentially, has been from the, uh, the what has been more resilient verticals, financial services, healthcare, government. Any green shoots in some of the other more COVID exposed uh, verticals, you know, your transportation, hospitality, entertainment, that sort of thing? You know, Eric, I, I would not call out any of the more affected verticals right now as, as uh, it, from our point of view, showing uh, green shoots. I would say that we were less exposed to those industries to begin with, um, and, but uh, no, we've not. I can't say that uh, we've seen the significant uh, changes in the uh, uh, in how they're faring. Uh, you know, at least from buying signals to us uh, over the last couple of quarters. Yeah, I think what I would add on that is just you know the the enterprise strength was it was across many of our verticals, and that was broad based and it was global. Right. So that, that was kind of a new green shoot for us in terms of what we were looking at. We, we've had resilience across the board on enterprise, but the broad-based uh, growth we saw on enterprise uh, was actually uh, pleasing for us. Okay, and that was echoed in the pipeline as well? Correct. Thank you. Your next question comes from Katie Weaver of Morgan Stanley. Thank you. Good afternoon. Kevin, what's the revenue contribution from PortWorks that's embedded in your fourth quarter internal model? And then, Charlie, can you provide a bit more color on Paul's decision to step down as COO? Are there, and are there any other changes or hires that you're planning to make on the back of his departure? Thanks. I'll, I'll hit the PortWorks first, Katie. Uh, you're super excited uh, with this strategic uh, acquisition. Uh, revenue is, is actually pretty small uh, in terms of uh, contribution as we look out in, into Q4. Uh, we'll probably see that start to build uh, in RPO and deferred revenue uh, before that starts uh, making its way uh, in any significant or meaningful way uh, to revenue. Yeah. Charlie, okay. you want to hit Paul? Thank Thank you, Katie. Yeah, I want to thank Paul for his contributions to the company over the past uh, year or so uh, that he's been here, and, and uh, he's uh, really brought a lot of structure uh, to our operations uh, at the company and contributed a lot and also was part of recruiting 
uh, Dominic uh, to the company. I, uh, in, in conversations with Paul, as we were recruiting Dominic, Paul started to feel, and I, I had to agree, that Dominic was going to, going to bring a lot of capabilities into the, uh, into the chief revenue officer role that uh, Paul, you know, had been handling. Uh, and Paul felt that, look, uh, that uh, given, given Dominic coming on board uh, and given the accession of, uh, you know, Jason Rose as, as chief marketing officer and so forth, that we really had, you know, a, a, a now a strong operating cadence and that, uh, you know, Paul's role as chief operating officer was not really a re- as required at the company. And that uh, you know he had a, a number of opportunities that he could uh, go pursue, uh, and so maybe it was better to make that uh, change. And and so we agreed with that. Paul's going to continue with us through the end of the quarter to ensure a smooth acquisition with Dominic, um, and then and then move on. And I do want to thank Paul for what he's contributed. And, and while I have this moment, I want to thank KD as well for his leadership of the sales force over the la- over the last three years on a global basis. Uh, KD has, you know, gotten us uh, he has, over his uh, uh, period of time leading the sales force. Uh, we've doubled om- almost every aspect of our uh, company, uh, the revenue, uh, the size of the company, the size of the sales force, et cetera. Uh, and he's uh, done a great job. You know, it, uh, bringing Dom on board really signals the fact that we're changing as a company, uh, having now moved from a single product to a two product to now a, a, a full portfolio both in the cloud uh, and on-prem and increasingly moving to subscription. Uh, and Dominic brings the right uh, type of background uh, for this next uh, step in our journey. And so we're very uh, pleased uh, pleased with that overall. Thank you for that color. And this concludes the question and answer session at this time. I'd like to turn the call over to Charlie and Jim Carla for closing remarks. Thank you. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank all of our employees, our customers, our partners, and for all of you on the call for your hard work and dedication uh, to, uh, to our mission. It's been a wild year, and it's not, not over yet. I'm looking forward to working with all of you to build a much better 2021. Thank you for joining us today, and stay safe, and uh, please have a very happy Thanksgiving to all of you. I know, I know we all need the, the rest. Uh, Please take time with family, and I look forward to engaging with you in the future. Take care.